The blasphemous enlightenment of Professor Francis Whalen Thurston of Boston, Providence, and the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti. In the late 1920s, Professor Thurston is putting a few final touches to a manuscript he intends no other person ever to lay eyes on so that no one else will have to suffer unnecessarily in the way he has this past year or so. When it's all done with, he just sits in silence for a few moments in the library of his Boston home, summer sunlight wandering over the oak walls, and then he breaks down and weeps like a lost soul for the better part of the day, letting up later that night. Professor Thurston is the nephew of George Gamel Angel, also a professor at Brown U, Providence, R.I., whose archaeological and anthropological unearthings led him, and after his death, led his nephew to some disturbing conclusions concerning the nature and fate of human life, with implications universal, even in their least astounding aspects. They discovered, positively, that throughout the world there exist savage cults which practice strange rites. Degenerate Eskimos in the Arctic, degenerate Caucasians in New England seaport towns, and degenerate Indians and mulattoes in the Louisiana swamps not far from Tulane University, New Orleans. The two professors also discovered that the primary aim of these cults is to await and welcome the return of anti-prehistoric monstrosities which will unseat the human race, overrun the earth, and generally have their way with our world. These beings are as detestably inhuman as humanly imaginable, though no more so. From the common individual's viewpoint, their nature is one of supreme evil and insanity, notwithstanding that the creatures themselves are indifferent to, if not totally unaware of, such mundane categories of value. From the beginning of time, they have held a certain attraction for persons interested in pursuing an existence of utter chaos and mayhem, that is, one of complete liberation at all conceivable levels. After learning the designs these beings have on our planet, Professor Thurston just assumes he will be murdered to keep him quiet on the subject, as his uncle and others have been. And to think that at one point in his investigation, he was planning to publish his findings in the Journal of the American Archaeological Society. All he can do now is wait. For some reason, however, the followers of the Great Old Ones, as the extraterrestrial entities are referred to, never followed through, and Professor Thurston appears to escape assassination, at least for an indefinite period of time. But this is of little comfort, because knowing what he knows, Professor Thurston is the most miserable being on Earth. He grieves for his lost dream of life, and even the sides of spring and flowers of summer are a horror to his eyes. It goes without saying that he now finds even the simplest daily task a joyless requisite for survival, and no more. After months of boredom and a personal devastation far worse than any worldwide apocalypse could possibly be, he decides to return to his old job at the university. 
Not that he believes any longer in the hollow conclusions of his once beloved anthropology, but at least it would give him a way to occupy himself, to lose himself. Still, he continues to be profoundly despondent, and his looks degenerate beyond polite comment. What's wrong, Professor Thurston? A student asks him one day after class. The professor glances up at the girl. After only the briefest gaze into her eyes, he can see that she really cares. Amazing, he thinks. Of course, there is no way he could tell her what is really wrong, but they do talk for a while, and later take a walk across the campus on a clear autumn afternoon. They begin to see each other secretly off campus, and with graduation day behind them, they finally get married, their ceremony solemn and discreet. The couple honeymoons at a picturesque little town on the seacoast of Massachusetts. To all appearances, several sublime days pass without one ripple of grief. One day, as he and his bride watch the sun descend into a perfectly unwrinkled ocean, Professor Thurston almost manages to rationalize into non-existence his dreadful knowledge. After all, he tells himself, there still exist precious human feeling and human beauty, e.g. the quaint little town created by human hands. These things have been perennially threatened by disorder and oblivion. Anyway, all of it was bound to end somehow, at some time. What difference did it make when the world was lost, or to whom? But Professor Thurston cannot sustain these consoling thoughts for long. All during their honeymoon, he snaps pictures of his smiling wife. He loves her dearly, but her innocence is tearing him apart. How long can he conceal the terrible things he knows about himself, about her, and about the world? Even after he takes a picture, this wonderful girl just keeps smiling at him. How long can he live with this new pain? The problem continues to obsess him, to the future detriment he fears of his marriage. Then, on the last night of the honeymoon, everything is resolved. He awakens in darkness from a strange dream he cannot recall. Outside the window of the bedroom, it sounds as though the whole town is in an ambivalent uproar. Hysterical voices blending festival and catastrophe. And there are weirdly colored lights quivering upon the bedroom wall. Professor Thurston's wife is also awake, and she says to her husband, The new masters have come in the night to their chosen city. Have you dreamed of them? There passes a moment of silence. Then, at last, Professor Thurston answers his wife with the long, abandoned howl of a madman or beast, for he too has dreamed the new dream, and, without his conscious knowledge or consent, has embraced the new world. And now, nothing can hurt him, as he has been so cruelly hurt in the past. Nothing will ever again cause him that pain he suffered so long, an intolerable anguish from which he could never have found release in any other way.